Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on vibrations and waves. The topic of this video is the boundary behavior of waves. And we want to know how does a wave behave when it reaches the free or fixed end of a medium, and how does a wave behave when it crosses the boundary from one medium into another. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. When a wave is traveling through a slinky or a body of water or any medium, it will eventually reach the end of the medium. And the manner in which it behaves at the end of the medium is known as boundary behavior. Boundary behavior also describes the behavior of a wave that encounters an obstacle that is in its path. In this video, we'll be focusing on three types of boundary behaviors. The behavior of a pulse when it reaches the fixed end of a medium. A fixed end might be a rope which is tightly secured to a pole. When that pulse reaches the end, that last segment of the rope is incapable of vibrating up and down because it's fixed on the pole. We will also be investigating the behavior of a pulse that reaches a free end. An example of a free end might be the same rope that is looped around the pole in such a manner that when the pulse reaches the end, the, that last segment of rope is capable of vibrating up and down. Finally, we'll be looking at the behavior of a pulse that reaches the boundary between one medium and another medium. The boundary is simply the, where the one medium ends and the next medium begins. Some questions will be asked are what happens to the pulse when it does reach the end? Will it bounce back? Will it disappear altogether? Will it pass into whatever is on the other side of that boundary? And second, we'll be asking how are the frequency, the wavelength, the amplitude, and the speed affected by the behavior that occurs at the boundary? Waves are commonly referred to as energy transport phenomenon because they transport energy from one location to another without actually displacing physical matter. When the energy carried by a wave reaches the end of a medium, there are two things you can expect to happen. First, a portion of that energy is reflected off the boundary and remains in the original material. And second, a portion of that energy is transmitted across the boundary. There are three vocabulary terms you should understand. First, the incident wave is the wave that is approaching the boundary. The reflected wave is the wave that has bounced off the boundary and remains in the original material. And finally, the transmitted wave is the wave that has crossed the boundary into the new obstacle or medium on the opposite side of that boundary. To illustrate, consider this diagram of a pulse moving through a medium that is attached to a second medium. We refer to that pulse as the incident pulse. When it reaches reaches the boundary, we will see two new pulses. One of them is the reflected pulse, the pulse that has reflected or bounced off the boundary and remains in the original material. And the second is the transmitted pulse that is in the new material on the opposite side of that boundary. Study this looping animation of a fixed in reflection and see what patterns you can observe. A very obvious pattern is that the reflected pulse is inverted. When I say inverted, I mean that the particles of the medium were displaced upwards when the incident pulse traveled through it, but when the reflected pulse traveled through it, the particles were displaced downwards. We refer to that as an inverted pulse. The second observation you might make is that there's no noticeable change in the speed or the wavelength of the wave. The pulse that was approaching the boundary had about the same speed and same length as the pulse that reflects off of the boundary. And because frequency depends upon speed and wavelength, we also would not expect any alteration in the frequency of the pulses. After all, waves propagate by particle-to-particle -particle interaction. One particle forces its neighboring particle into vibrational motion at the same frequency. So we would never expect any alteration in the frequency of the pulse or wave when moving through a uniform medium. Finally, though not pictured in the animation, we would expect the amplitude of the reflected pulse to be less than the amplitude of the incident pulse. A portion of the energy is always transmitted across the boundary, and because amplitude reflects the amount of energy that is transported by the wave, a loss of energy means a loss of amplitude. This looping animation depicts free end reflection. Notice that the last particle of the medium is free to move up and down once the pulse reaches it. What patterns do you observe? 
There are three patterns I'll point out. The first is the rather obvious one, that unlike fixed end reflection, there is no inversion with free end reflection. As the incident pulse approaches the boundary, particles are displaced upward, and as the reflected pulse leaves the boundary, the particles of the medium are still displaced upwards. No inversion. The second pattern that I would state is that there's no noticeable change in the speed or the wavelength of the reflected pulse compared to the incident pulse. We made the same observation for fixed end reflection, and since the frequency depends upon the speed and the wavelength, we could also assert that there's no change in the frequency of the reflected pulse compared to the incident pulse. Finally, while it's not obvious in the animation, we would expect that the amplitude of the reflected pulse to be less than the amplitude of the incident pulse since a portion of the energy is being transmitted across the boundary. This looping animation depicts a pulse moving through a more dense medium and approaching the boundary with a less dense medium. What do you observe? Well, there's a lot to see here, and I'm going to point out five things. The first thing I'm going to point out is that there's no inversion whatsoever. Neither the reflected pulse nor the transmitted pulse are inverted. In all situations, particles are displaced upwards. The second item I'm going to point out is not really observable, but we have to get to it, and that is that the frequency of the incident pulse equal the frequency of the reflected pulse is equal to the frequency of the transmitted pulse. I refer to this as handshake logic. At the boundary between the more dense and the less dense material, there's a adjoinment of particles, and that last particle in the more dense medium is vibrating up and down to cause the transmission of the pulse across the boundary to the first particle of the, of the second medium. Now they have to remain connected in order for this to happen. And if you think of two hands shaking one another, let's say you were to shake the hands with a person, if you were to shake frequently, that other hand on the other side of the boundary would have to shake with the same frequency. If it didn't, you would lose the handshake. You would no longer be adjoining one another. I refer to this as handshake logic and it's what explains why the frequency doesn't change at the boundary. The second, the third item I'm going to point out is that the speed of the incident pulse is the same as the speed of the reflected pulse, but the speed of the transmitted pulse is greater than the speed of both incident and reflected pulse. This is because the speeds of waves depend upon the property of the medium, and the main property here is the density of the two medium. And speeds travel faster in least dense materials, and so the speed of the transmitted pulse is greater since that material has less density. Now the fourth point I'm going to make is that the wavelengths are different and you can observe it if you study the animation. Here the wavelength of the incident pulse is the same as the wavelength of the reflected pulse but the wavelength of the transmitted pulse is longer than the wavelength of both incident and reflected pulse. This can be explained by math logic because wavelength depends upon speed and frequency since the frequencies are the same for the two media where the speed is the greatest, that's where the wavelength is greatest, that means it's greatest in the least dense material. The final point that is observable in this animation is that there's a difference in amplitude of the reflected pulse compared to the incident pulse. That's due to energy considerations because a portion of the energy is transmitted across the boundary such that when that reflected pulse remains in the original material, there's less energy in it and thus it has a smaller amplitude. This looping animation presents the opposite case of a pulse in a less dense material heading towards the boundary with a more dense material. I'm going to point out five things. The first observation that's clear is that the reflected pulse is inverted. That is, as the reflected pulse moves through the medium, particles are displaced downwards, unlike the incident pulse in which particles were displaced upwards. The second claim is that the frequency of all particles are going to be the same. That's from the handshake logic discussed earlier. So the frequency of incident reflected and transmitted waves are equal to one another. The third point is clearly seen in the animation, and that is that the speeds of the incident and reflected pulse are equal to each other, but both those speeds are greater than the speed of the transmitted pulse, and that, that is because the speeds will always be greatest in the least dense material. 
The fourth point has to do with wavelengths, and you can see it in the animation, that the wavelength or length of the incident and reflected pulse are equal to one another, but both of those wavelengths are greater than the wavelength of the transmitted pulse. Not only can we observe it, it makes sense based on math logic. The final observation has to do with the amplitude, and that is that the amplitude of the reflected pulse is less than the amplitude of the incident pulse, and that's due to energy considerations, since some energy is transmitted across the boundary, the reflected pulse carries less energy. Here's a quick summary of the two situations we just discussed. First, the before and after diagrams on the left depict a pulse in the less dense material heading towards the more dense material, and the before and after diagrams on the right depict a pulse in the more dense material heading towards the less dense material. Here's four summary points that are good to put in your noodle. The first one is the frequency is the same in each of the media. The second point is that the speed will always be greatest in the least dense material. The third is that the wavelength will always be greatest in the least dense material. And finally, the inversion of the reflected pulse only occurs when, a pul when the incident pulse is in the less dense material heading towards the more dense material. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, but before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website, and I've left links to each in the description section of this video. You have a simulation which allows you to manipulate a variable, observe the result. You have a great minds-on physics mission on boundary behavior waves, and finally, here's a tutorial page that that you can reference when you need one. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.